Hey, do you want to take a photo now? Yeah, okay. okay. All right, so I'm talking now to um, Amalia Rose Hillary. Is this yes. correct? Yes. All right, all right. So you're the brand ambassador of the marathon we, we just run. Yes. Okay. Yes. What did you exactly as a brand ambassador? I'm very curious. Well, I guess, you know, I was initially called on to represent my family. On the, you know, the name saying Hillary is attached to the marathon. But also, you know, for me, I, I got involved because the, the, I think this race highlights the real beauty of this country. It's a very unique race, starting at base camp, going through the ice, you get to see the beautiful train that made this country famous. And so for me, I, you know, I'm involved in the marathon on the day, and also promotions overseas. As well. okay. Have you run a marathon so far? I have never run an official marathon, actually, but I have run around these areas. You know, I used to when I was staying in different towns. As you've learned, the only way to go from one place to another is to walk. And so sometimes I used to run. So I've run many times from Dingbo Shay down to Namchi and back for lunch or something. What, what do you think about? Uh, runners coming to, to the average marathon. Well, I, think it's a, you know, <laughs> I, I, I think it's a great thing. You know, I, for a lot of people, I see it as not only a great opportunity to see the country, but also maybe a gateway into many other things. And it's interesting, each year it's different, the marathon groups. A few years ago, we had people who had never run marathons. The majority of people had never run a marathon, but they just liked the idea of being involved in this Everest marathon. And after that, some of them decided to get fitter, get into trekking. There was that side. While this group this year, I find you know a lot of people actually are more, if not professional, but very you know are, are athletes in some way. And I, for me, I guess the special thing for everyone here is maybe the introduction to the Nepali culture, which I don't think really many people. About, or maybe even knew the beauty of this country. So. Uh, every person, every person has a dream in his life. Yes. I hope you agree with it. What's yours? Well, I guess uh, I have many dreams. I grew up in a family where everyone, I guess, excelled and did a lot, and so I have big ambitions. And you know, my, I really, my ambitions are really. Um, my dreams would be around this country. I, you know, I, I'm a big, I love climbing, but my dreams wouldn't be on that. It would be more those hopes that I have here for changes in the political system, and, but also just the general overall of the country through different programs that my family have been involved in and our foundations have been doing for the last 50 years, but also some of the new ones that I've been developing. And I really hope for some of these new concepts I've developed to really actually change the life of people here. And that's, yeah, that would be my dream. About uh, the name that you're wearing, okay, so your grandfather is the first person on earth to climb the highest mountain. Um, is this, uh, this name is a pressure or is it a great opportunity to do great things? Well, I think it's all about how you look at things. And so you can either see it as living in the shadow and you look at it, you can never be the first person to climb Mount Everest again. And you know, some of the things he did, he was also the first person to all three poles, the North and South Pole. He went to the North Pole with Neil Armstrong. He's done amazing things. My father's had an amazing climb history. He's done Everest twice. He's raised millions of dollars every year for these areas. So it's high expectations in some ways. Or you can see it in your living in the light of these people. I, I'm you know, a young woman who grew up in Australia and New Zealand. Why, and I have a very special connection with Nepal and with the mountaineering community and people here. And I have that because of my grandfather, because of my father. I know so much about this region and I know about the mountains and so many things that I would not have if it wasn't for them. So for me, I see it as a positive thing. I'm very fortunate to be born in the family I am because otherwise I wouldn't be here sitting with you and I wouldn't have had the opportunities I had. So. Okay, uh, I see you're very relaxed in front of the camera. Um, <laughs> did you study um, how to... No, I, I never studied it. I, I guess uh, just, I, I'm kind of used to it, to be honest. Um, you know, uh, my grandfather was a public person, but also he was a very you know, private person in many ways. And we're very fortunate where there's no thing in New Zealand like paparazzi or anything like that. And we never, my family never had that celebrity status. But, you know, particularly in this area, people coming to Nepal, 
generally have an interest in my family's work, my grandfather, maybe the Everest climb. And if people want to talk to me, and whether it's with a camera or just face to face about things, I, I, I've got to respect that that interest. And if people are showing interest in something to do with my family, I, I see it as an honour. So from a young age, I've loved, you know, if people want to talk about it, I like to sit down and talk. I, of what I hate the most is when people, I get too many people asking me questions because I feel I can't answer them properly and I really feel, you know, you should do things 100%, this is what I was taught. So, I guess I'm, I'm used to it more than anything. <laughs> What's the, mo the most powerful memory that you, you have uh, related to your grandfather? Um, well, I can, the first one that comes to mind is actually not... Uh, well, you know, the memories I have uh, of him as a grandfather, you know, actually it was only recently, really when he passed away and I got more involved in the work here and kind of stepped up and said, yes, I want to be a part of it, that I really started appreciating what he had done. Before that, it was always, he was, he was Ed, he was Grandpa Ed, you know. I remember hiding under his office desk and I was eating Nutella, I was covered in Nutella, I was about five years old and I was holding the ice axe. And then some interviewers came over, they were Ameri I forget what newspaper they were from, they were from the States, so and they were asking him about the climb, about many different things, and it was the 40th anniversary of the ascent. And I came out with, you know, Nutella, you know, the chocolate Nutella cover, and the ice axe that first went to the summit of Everest, which is now in a museum. And these people were absolutely horrified, and I was just wandering around the house with it because, you know, the, and honestly, he was pretty modest and pretty humble in that way, so these are the things I remember. About him, I, I don't think we ever ever really spoke about the, his Everest climb. Actually, we, we spoke about rugby and the All Blacks and what was going on there. That was pretty much our baseline. But what kind of um, bedtime stories uh, was he telling you? Well, I, well, he wasn't really a bedtime storyteller, to be honest. Now, you know, we, I honestly, I very rarely spoke with him about, you know, the sort of his exploration and these things. I spoke with him about our family friends in Kufu, but we never really went, I, we just never had that relationship, it's interesting, I've learned more about him and that side from his friends and other family members, but the relationship we had was really just a very, very simple little granddaughter and grandfather relationship, so. Because one of the reasons I started to run was uh, to have a, a large collection of um, bedtime stories from my grandchildren. Well, my father tells me stories, so yeah. that's, you know, I guess, you know, my grandfather, I, I obviously I didn't live with, and my father has done that, and I, you know, his, I know most of his stories inside out. I can tell you about when he's on Ahmed Ablam, or here and there, when he was young, and down his trips in India, or in the alleyways in Tamil and Kathmandu, so I definitely have that relationship with my father. What do you think that makes people want to go to the highest mountains, or the... I don't know, exploring uh, territories or well, doing crazy things. Oh, doing crazy things. So I, I tend to think there's probably a bit of an insanity gene somewhere there, and I'm sure I probably have it as well. But I think there's something as well about... You know, it's different for different people, but it's like, like for me, I, I had a client recently, I was bringing up here, and he just hated trekking. He hated all of it. He, he couldn't admire the beauty because he just, he, he didn't enjoy the physical exertion or anything like that. While, for me, I love it. I love when you're on a mountain and you're working, you've been for eight hours and you're trying to get to that summit, and that mental challenge, that physical challenge, the, the camaraderie that you develop with your team. like. like like how you have actually with you know, going up to Everest with the marathon runners, you know, I can see it here tonight, it's that camaraderie for me, and I know for many people that's one of the big draws actually into expeditions and this sort of adventure life, and pushing those boundaries I think is another one, that, and being really close to the environment, like, look at your average life nowadays, in your western life in the big cities, people aren't connected to the environment at all, and they just spend very little time, but you know, you come out here you see these many 5,000 foot mountains of rock and ice and they're not just objects, these 
they're such massive, they almost, they have these energy fields to them, you know, when you really look at these big ones, like Everest, you can feel something with them, and being around them, and it's just a challenge, but it's different for every person, and, you know, there are some people who do it for glory, they like to be able to say, oh, look, I've climbed the highest mountain on earth, or I've done this, I've done that, and it's nothing to do with passion of it, it's actually to do with ego, so it depends. Amali, you're, you're a climber yourself, right? Yes. Uh, why didn't you climb Everest so far? I think it's a common question. In, uh... Well, I guess, you know, I, I consider myself uh, not that old yet. And so I still have a lot of time. And something that's very important to me, and uh, but it, it's expected from my family, that if you were going to climb, you cannot use, you know, if I used my last name as a Hillary and got dragged up to the summit of Everest, that would be totally unacceptable in my family. If four, four Sherpas could take you... Exactly, you know, and that, and that, like, with the last name, I could probably get that to happen. But in my family, if you're going to do something, you do it properly. You do your apprenticeship. You become a strong climber. You get your fit fitness to the peak. But you learn about mountains. You understand. You spend at least five years, you know, or several years, really climbing, learning about mountains. Because something I learned when I was actually studying um, how to be a pilot, a helicopter pilot, is that when you're studying to be a pilot, 98% of your training, it's not about technical or skill, it's about what happens when things go wrong. And mountains are dangerous places, you know, if you do not do your boot up properly and it catches on your crampon, you'll you shoot off the face of the mountain and die. You, if you make a mistake, it doesn't matter if it's on the way up or the way down, if you can die, it's serious. And so it needs to be second nature, how to climb and how to read the winds and understand things. Because then this is a safe climber, a responsible climber. Not only for yourself, but your climbing partner and your climbing team. What's your deepest fear? Are you scared of heights or flying? <laughs> no, like I, I, you know, if I went to the edge of a cliff, I, I definitely, you know, my body goes, oh, this is not right. But I guess the thing is, is that I've grown up learning that, you know, to use your fear and instead, instead of being scared of it, you know, scared of it, use your fear, then be, ex you know, be extra cautious about where you're going and what you're doing. And I, I guess the adrenaline, I, I quite like the adrenaline of it as well. I guess some people would say I'm a bit of a, a junkie on it. What's the best book you've read so far about climbing? Best book? Or about your grandfather? Well, you know, I think uh, here's some of his last books, you know, View from the Summit. These are very well, I, you know, I think at the end of the day, if you're talking about a book, about someone it is always going to be not always but generally it's always going to be better when it's written by them because then you also get to get into their head a little bit and i think he wrote the book quite well and, and it sort of explains you know how what he thought about things so it's not just what you google on the internet the facts of the expedition you get to see the facts with what the thoughts were behind so it makes it much more 3d personable okay now we are in a year um, 2025 okay um, and um, the future Amalia sees this uh, this movie. What what advice do you have for her? What advice to that? <laughs> so, yeah. Oh God! So, but what, what, so I the advice for the past? <laughs> yeah, an advice for the past. Let's see. Yeah, yeah. Advice in the past. Oh, I have no idea. I've never been asked that question before. <laughs> um, I guess that you know something that is very I think is hard in life. And this isn't just about my life, it's what I see in everyone, is that staying true to who you are and not getting swayed on what your friends around you or maybe culture or what society thinks, holding if you've got certain beliefs and I have quite strong beliefs on things and you know, I've got very involved here on a lot of uh, work with the government trying to change laws on human rights, on life rights, animal rights, because these are things I believe in, so I guess it would be to don't don't stray off the right path, maybe. Would you keep this advice also for your future children? Oh, definitely. Yeah. I, I think, you know, the one thing I once said to a friend when she was going a bit off the path, so to speak, is that every day, even if it's just metaphorical, go look in the mirror. Do you like the person you see? And it's not about aesthetically, it's not about is my hair, am I, am I 
five pounds, ten pounds overweight. It's about the person that you actually are, not the one you're trying to pr promote to people. Who are you really? Are you a good person? Are you a good friend? Do you like that person? Because if you don't like yourself, you will. And I think that, you know, for me, this is a very big thing. That sometimes I think people actually lose. They don't realize who they think they're one person, but who they really are is actually quite different. And it happens overnight. You know, it can be like, oh, you got a new job, and then you start stop seeing these friends, and then this happens and that happens. And then all of a sudden, you could have gone from someone who read every day and was very politically active or socially active in the community to maybe just drinking every day and watching TV. And you go, hold on, this isn't me. This isn't the person I want to be. I have 30 seconds of Oh, okay. So yes, uh, question. Uh, what do you know about Romania? Pardon? What do you know about Romania? I don't know. I, I guess you know that after the last comments, they're all like under the vampires. Well, I, I was living in Paris for a while, and I always heard about the beautiful architecture of Romania and some of the old castles and what have you. And I've heard there's some quite good rock climbing as well, actually. Do you know any climber? Pardon? Do you know any climber? No, I actually don't from Romania. So I'm sure my father knows We have, uh, so right now, we have a young climber called Coco Rina Popescu. She's the youngest uh, uh, climber who've done uh, uh, um, Westeros, Seven Volcanoes, and uh, these six summits. And she's done, uh, she's um, about to do the Everest now. Oh, fantastic. She will be on the youngest to do uh, the Seven Summits. Oh, really? She's How old is she? Yeah. Is, you know, like, do you have any advice for her? Be careful. Be very, very careful. Um, you know, and good luck. What an achievement. I've done a couple of the seven summits and I've been climbing my whole life. But, you know, that's, that's an amazing feat. She must obviously love what she's doing. And, you know, I wish her the best and I can't wait to hear what she's doing in 10 years' time, actually. So, yeah. Thank you very much.